Good afternoon, my name is Marty Kendall and today I'm going to talk to you about managing insulin to optimise nutrition. So first up, some disclaimers. I'm an engineer, not a doctor. I like to see graphs, numbers and I uh, like to process the data myself to try and understand um, how things work before implementing it in my life. I'm personally invested in this approach. Uh, this is how my family eat. And I've got a blog that I'd love you to check out, Optimising Nutrition. Um, six months ago, I started sharing some thoughts on the Food Insulin Index and uh, how we can optimise our nutrition by, with our understanding of macronutrients and micronutrients. Just this morning, it ticked over a quarter of a million views, which I'm um, yeah, totally over the moon about. So uh, yeah, I'd love you to check it out. And uh, all the details that are in here are on the blog as well. So the obvious elephant in the room is uh, why is an engineer here talking to you about nutrition? Well, I suppose it's personal. I've got a family history of type 2 diabetes and obesity. Personally, I've struggled to maintain my weight and in spite of doing a lot of exercise. About a year ago, I um, got some blood tests that indicated I was developing fatty liver and had high blood glucose levels and was basically developing metabolic syndrome. But more importantly, my wife, uh, Monica, has been a type 1 diabetic for three decades. Together we've been through two pregnancies and um, I suppose through living with diabetes day in, day out, I've got a really intimate understanding of what it takes to measure and manage blood sugar and its importance to um, optimal health, vitality and well-being. So a day in the life of a type 1 diabetic is uh, a lot like a blood sugar roller coaster. You're probably aware that glucose drives blood sugar up, insulin drives it back down. But it's not just the high blood sugar levels that really make you feel crummy. It's the, the, the amplitude of the swings going up and down and up and down all day. It's, um, and as Bernstein says, it's, uh, you know, if you put major inputs of glucose into your body, you then have to put major inputs of insulin into your body. Um, and the, the ability to miscalculate that and overshoot and drive yourself low is really high. So all of a sudden you're, you're driving yourself low, you've, you've got to eat more glucose to get out of that low and it's an ongoing cycle. Um, this is what a, a typical day for someone following the uh, recommended diet for diabetics and the rest of us looks like with a continuous glucose monitor. As you can see, it's, it's up and down, you eat, you inject, you bring your blood sugars back down, and it's basically a roller coaster all day. Um, what you're trying to do is, is not go low because you feel really bad, and uh, so you end up running quite high and well outside that green um, target zone. The bottom slide is the same person two months later after um, learning to manage their carb in intake um, by following the ways of uh, Dr. Richard Bernstein. Uh, but by managing the, the insulin load of your diet, you're then able to really stabilise your blood glucose levels. So um, this is our little N equals 2. If you're trying to measure insulin in a normal healthy person, you have to you know, draw blood every few hours and, and it'd be horrifically expensive. But um, for a type 1 diabetic, it's just a matter of downloading the data from the insulin pump. And if you've got a nerdy engineering husband, you can uh, plot it in a graph in Excel and voila, here we are. So what you can see is my wife's daily insulin dose over the last 18 months or so. I suppose it's a bit of a, a story of our journey. Back here, um, we were eating what we thought was a fairly healthy, you know, nutrient-dense, paleo-ish diet. Um, but obviously, the overall insulin load was a fair bit higher. Last year about this time we went to the Low Carb Down Under seminar in Brisbane and I suppose we got a bit more of an insight. My wife said, oh, okay, we'll give this, give this a shot and we'll try to eat a little bit more low carb. You can see um, going lower carb, you end up with a, a reduced insulin load. The, the units come down from 38 to 26 or so. Um, at the Low Carb Down Under meeting we met a couple of people who are part of um, the online group Type 1 Grit. Uh, and we joined that in January and what we saw there was a whole bunch of people thriving, uh, not just surviving, but thriving and living really healthy, vital lives, um, eating a fairly high fat diet um, and with really flat line blood sugars that went, wow, I've never seen that before, how do we get that? I suppose my wife understood that there was a way, there was a hope that you could eat like that and uh, stabilise your blood sugars. So you can see from 36 back here, 
we've come down to 22 or so, basically halved the blood sugar, the um, insulin dose per day. Different things affect insulin on a day-to-day -day basis, including infection and hormones and stress. So through this period, she had a, an infection which resolved itself and came back down. So it's interesting too how insulin's related to health and vitality and overall well-being and hormonal regulation. And overall, um, you can see there's a general improvement. Um, I suppose Monica's blood sugars and glucose and um, my face tells the story. I don't think the hair's moved in 18 months, but there's definitely a, a change in, in my face and my overall vitality and well-being. So if insulin is so important, um, how can we measure it? How can we quantify it? You've probably heard of the glycemic index, um, which is the measure of the blood glucose response to food over two or three hours relative to glucose. Um, more recently, more work has been done into the food insulin index, which is potentially even more exciting and more fascinating. What they do, they measure the area under the curve of the insulin response to food over three hours and compare that to glucose. I think potentially it's more exciting than the glycemic index because it's not just measuring the glucose response, which can change depending on your pancreatic function and your insulin sensitivity. It's actually measuring it's a measure of the glucose being metabolised in your body, so it's a much more accurate measure of the amount of glucose you're intaking, whether it be from protein or carbohydrate or, or wherever. So looking at the early insulin index data back in 1997, done by Suzanne Holt, um, 38 data points, it's, it's interesting, but I suppose overall the, the conclusion was, what do we do with this? It's a bit confusing. You can see um, all brand has got a low response, eggs have got a low response, peanuts have got a low response, jelly beans are high, potatoes are high, but what does it mean? I suppose since 1997 not much has been done with this data. But um, after hearing Jason Fung talk about the, in the, the food insulin index and, and its impact on an, and, and the glycemic index, uh, the, the, the glycemic effect of protein, I went digging further and came across the, um, the data gold mine which is this thesis by Kirstine Bell from the University of Sydney. Um, what they did is they've, uh, they've taken all the data that's been done to date, all the testing, and then extended that further to have more than 100 foods now indexed. Uh, what they're effectively trying to do was build a new glycemic index um, to help uh, insulin predict, better predict insulin dosing for type 1 diabetics and help aid food selection for type 2 diabetics. So being a curious engineer, I thought, mm, let's download the data, throw it into a spreadsheet and see how it looks. I suppose what you can see is uh, carbohydrate is somewhat related to insulin response, but at the same time, you know, it, it, it's not that clear, it's not that direct. What we can see is uh, butter, olive oil, bacon have a very low insulin response whereas glucose, jelly beans have a really high insulin response. But what gets a little bit more confusing is high protein foods such as fish, steak, cheese also have a high insulin response, which you sort of understand when you realise that um, most amino acids are actually insulinogenic as well. As you can see in this column here, it's only lysine and leucine that, uh, that convert directly to ketones. The, uh, the amino acids in the centre column can go either way depending on the requirement of the body at the time. And this longer list on the left hand side, if not required for muscle protein sy synthesis, can circulate in your body, in your bloodstream, until required to be converted into glucose to uh, stabilise your blood sugar. So, and in the long run, if, uh, you know, if they're glucose, they need insulin, they can also be converted to fat if you've got really, really high levels of protein. So what I thought, I'd heard that um, protein requires about half as much insulin as carbohydrate. So I ran a sensitivity analysis looking at different factors and found that you know, about half, say 56% of protein um, is insulinogenic. And so if we plot carbohydrates plus about half protein, what we get is we get a correction in uh, the fish and the steak and the cheese that we're sitting over here. Uh, so we, we get a bit of a correction there. 
Uh, another fascinating thing is if you look down here, you see that the, the, the high fiber foods are also have a lower insulin response than you'd expect compared to the higher, uh, the, the lower fiber foods at the top here. Um, more processed foods have a very high insulin response. You've probably heard of the concept of net carbohydrates. Um, the idea is that, um, that, that the gut bacteria will use those foods to, to feed the gut bacteria rather than being digested by our body into calories to be used and requiring insulin. So if we then correct for that, if we say fiber, uh, carbohydrate minus fiber plus about half protein, you get again a better correlation between what we're eating and the food insulin response. One of the issues I think if you're avoiding total, if, you, if, you, if you're counting total carbs, you can potentially avoid all non-starchy veggies, which leaves you potentially nutrient deficient. Um, what we see in the type 1 diabetic community is uh, high fibre foods from natural sources such as green leafy veggies, typically you don't need to dose insulin for, but highly processed foods, so you know, low in net carbs, uh, they do, you know, they typically ignore that and, and just dose for the total carbs. Another fascinating, another step, I thought, you know, the, the, the points still sitting down here are the ones that are high in fructose. Um, we know from the glycemic index that uh, fructose has a glycemic response of 19 compared to glucose. How that works is fructose can be converted, converted to glucose, which then requires insulin, but, only, but, but not as much. So then again, if we correct for the high fructose foods, we find that net carbs plus half the protein minus about three quarters of the fructose gives you a much better correlation. So we've gone from a fairly scattered approach, understood the various things that affect insulin and brought it into a, a much more accurate uh, impact, uh, 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 prediction of our insulin response. Um, this also applies with glucose. So they also measured the glucose response, similar looking at the glucose over two or three hours. Um, so what this means is effectively, if you want to manage your, your blood glucose or insulin levels, we need to uh, basically reduce the things that raise that up. I believe we need to basically work within the capacity of our own pancreas, our own insulin sensitivity, to maintain blood sugars within our ability to respond to the food we're eating. If you want to you know, look at it simply, um, rather than all those complex numbers and graphs, you can just say, you know, a higher fat food will have a lower insulin response, whereas a, higher, a, a, lower, a lower fat food, a higher carbohydrate food, a higher glucose food will have a higher insulin response. So being a uh, good little engineer, I thought there's a formula on this somewhere. So we can actually convert it. Uh, rather than just carb counting, you can say the insulin load equals carbohydrates minus fiber plus about half the protein. We can then, um, you know, rearrange that to say the percentage of insulogenic calories is blah, 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 as you see up there. Uh, this all looks like a bit of mumbo jumbo until you say, well, how can we use this to rank our foods based on our insulin response, including fiber and protein? Haven't included fructose, because you know, not everybody agrees on whether fructose is a healthy thing and it's hard to get all the data for that. But you can see, um, other than you know, fats and oils, which are obviously have an insulin, insulogenic percentage of zero, you've got olives, cream, pecans, you know, various nuts. And on this side, you've got basically high sugar foods. So intuitively, it seems to work. So I think the uh, possible applications for this are, are really quite exciting. Potentially, you can, um, closer to my heart and where I started thinking about this, we can more accurately predict insulin dosing for type 1 diabetics. Um, but more importantly, potentially for, for people trying to optimise their diet to manage therapeutic ketosis, we can use this to actually better quantify the insulin load of our diet to, um, to actually achieve therapeutic ketosis. The question is, is it, is it better than carb counting? I think potentially it is. If you're trying to manage the insulin load of your diet, to keep within your pancreas's ability to keep up and your own personal insulin sensitivity, I think we can then um, count the insulin load of our diet and keep that down enough to a point that we can uh, you know, keep our blood sugars within an optimal range.
as you can see, there's a, it's a quantitative mechanism for prioritising foods for people with diabetes. But, uh, you know, can you live on butter and olive oil and bacon all day, every day? Some people say yes, um, but potentially no. We also need to consider nutrition. I think where it gets really, really exciting is where you can combine our understanding of the insulin load of our diet being affected by um, fibre and protein and carbohydrates with uh, nutrient density to design the optimal, food, uh, optimal foods for therapeutic ketosis, diabetes and nutritional ketosis, for fat loss and for insulin sensitive and metabolically healthy people. So potentially there's some awesome, exciting applications for this that, uh, yeah, it's an honour to share. Thank you. Thank you.